Okay, brethren, uh, I think you know that uh, this is the uh, a holy day. Today is the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the 15th day of Abib or, or, or Nissan, which I've reminded you before is not a Japanese motor car. It's the first month of the Hebrew year. And uh, if you look around today, I rather imagine wherever you are, you'll find that not too many folk around you are keeping this uh, festival day in your neighborhood. It might be exceptional, but I think I'm probably in strong ground in saying that, that you are a minority. Wherever you are, we're a minority, right? And actually we're quite a minor minority. Not many people at all keep the biblical holy days. Very, very few. Um, and you can ask the question, I think it's a decent question, you know, why, why do we keep God's holy days? What's the reason? I suppose the simplest reason is, well, God commands it. So God says, keep them, we keep them. That's good enough in many ways, right? But there's more to it than that, of course. We could then ask the question, I wonder why God wants us to keep his uh, holy days. Does God have a, a purpose? To which I think the answer is yes, God does indeed have a purpose. He has an important purpose. When he asks us to keep any of his holy days, any of his appointed times. So for meat and due season, my feeling always is on the holy days, we need to spend at least some time looking at the purpose that God gave us the holy days for. All right. So let's start in Leviticus 23 and catch the meaning of, you know, why keep the feast of unleavened bread? What is it about leaven that we could look at and learn from? So here we are in Leviticus chapter 23 and uh, let's read verses 1 to 2 and then verses 4 through 8. So Leviticus 23. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, The feasts of the Lord. Actually not a great translation. Uh, the feasts is the Hebrew word uh, moed, or moedim, which means uh, really appointed time. The appointed times of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, holy assemblies, these are my feasts or my appointed times. That's the introduction to the chapter. If we drop down to verse 4, these are the feasts or appointed times of the Lord, holy convocations which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. The translators, for some reason, put it correctly there. They're quite inconsistent. Verse 5. On the fourteenth day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month, which is today, is the feast. And it's properly feast in the sense of a banquet, lots of food and drink. On the fifteenth day of the same month today is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day, that's today, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. That's why we're not at work, not in our shops, factories and so on. Verse 8, but you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day also shall be a holy convocation, a holy assembly. You shall do no customary work on it either. Now, verse 8 talks about an offering made by fire. Well, uh, we don't do that for the obvious reasons. You know, back in those days when uh, this verse was presented to the people, there was a tabernacle. Subsequently, there was uh, a temple at which offerings by fire could be made. Well, that, as we know, stopped about 2,000 years ago. So we don't do that part, but we do do the rest, right? And... Uh, if you want to understand you know, what the Feast of Unleavened Bread is all about, probably a good place to start is at the first reference to it. Because very often the first time we come across something, it's explained in a, a little bit more detail to give us the, uh, the background, the understanding, what we need to know. So let's look at the first time in Scripture we find any reference to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that's in Exodus chapter 12. So let's turn back to Exodus and chapter 12. <clears throat> so 
So we're going to read verses uh, 14 through 20. So Exodus chapter 12 and beginning at verse 14. So this day shall be to you a memorial. We'll see what day it is in just a moment. But whatever day it is, it's a memorial. Something that we are to keep in memory, to remember. So this day shall be to you a memorial. And you shall keep it as a feast, that's proper feast, to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast, a banquet, by an everlasting ordinance. So you get a feeling there, it's through your generations, generation after generation. It's an everlasting or a long-lasting ordinance. Verse 15, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day, that's today, you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day, there shall be a holy convocation. And on the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which everyone must eat that only may be prepared by you. So you can have your Wheaty Bangs in the morning and uh, your fried eggs late in the day, but uh, no toast. Well, unless it's unleavened toast, of course. Verse 17. So you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this same day, ah, this same day, I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. So the day which is a memorial, right, is the day that they leave Egypt, that's why they're remembering it, which is the 15th day of the first month. Therefore, you shall observe this day, the 15th day, the day you left Egypt, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance, something you have to keep on doing. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread, until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native of the land. Verse 20, you shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread. And of course it's all fairly familiar to us. I think many of us have kept uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread for quite a long time. Uh, next year will be my, uh, my uh, 50th year of keeping the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But since we're here in Exodus chapter 12 and just reading these verses here, it's worthwhile remembering that we're still, not us personally of course, but they're still in Egypt, right? This is the Passover chapter. Uh, the instructions are being conveyed to the people of Israel, but at that stage there, the Passover has yet to come. They are yet to leave Egypt. They are yet to leave slavery and head off to the Promised Land. So these instructions to keep Passover and to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread are given to them in Egypt. And the relevance of that is that that's about two months or so prior to getting to Mount Sinai. That's two months or so prior to the Old Covenant being uh, offered to ancient Israel. So some people will say, oh, well, hang on a second, we don't keep uh, Passover, we don't keep Feast of Unleavened Bread because the Old Covenant is done away. We've got a new covenant now, so the Old Covenant is swept away and so are the holy days. Well, that couldn't be the case here because Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread are given two months or so before the Old Covenant. So if the Old Covenant ended and sweeps things away, they couldn't change the instructions given here to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread as a memorial, as an everlasting ordinance in all your generations, right? You can't do away with that. It's part of the Old Covenant. It wasn't uh, part of the Old Covenant per se. And when we get to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which they were given instructions for in Egypt, etc., uh, there are some special instructions, uh, specific instructions that apply to the people. So let's look at Exodus 13, next chapter along. And we'll read verses uh, 3 and then 6 to 7. Exodus 
Exodus chapter 13 and uh, verse 3. And Moses said to the people, Remember this day, which day? This day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. And the day they went out is the 15th day. 14th was Passover, 15th the feast is the day they left. That's the memorial day that you and I are still memorialising today. No leavened bread shall be eaten. You know, fair enough, I think we, we know that. Just to hang in there for the next few days before you can get some nice fluffy toast in just over a week's time. Let's drop down to verses 6 through 7. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Now, I tend to take that to mean that really every day you ought to eat at least some leavened bread. It says seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. It might be a token amount. Maybe you don't like uh, your unleavened bread. <laughs> Maybe it tastes horrible and plays havoc with your teeth and your gums. Well, fair enough, right? You don't need to eat a lot of it, but I think you ought to eat some unleavened bread you know, every day. Uh, some people said, well, I think what it means is when you eat bread, if you eat bread, you should make sure it's unleavened bread. So it just means that's all it means. But you might choose on a particular day not, not to eat any bread. And therefore, that's fine. That's what they say. I don't go along with that because I think it's possible that you could skip every day, <laughs> not eat any bread. Neither on the first day, the second, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, you just didn't eat any bread. Right? Which you say, well, I, I didn't eat any leavened bread. But it does say here, seven days you shall eat. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. If you want to learn the lessons of eating unleavened bread, then I think we have to eat unleavened bread. And at least a token amount, if no more, day by day by day, just to remind us of the feast. When you pick up, you know, your, your unleavened bread and think, oh my word, horrible stuff, bread of affliction. Don't you dare say that. <clears throat> well, my wife's unleavened bread is, of course, superb. But uh, just thinking of other people whose unleavened bread might be pretty naff, that when you eat it, it reminds you, oh, of course, this is the feast of unleavened bread for seven days. So, hence, best to eat some unleavened bread every day. Verse 6 again. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. Not six days, not four days, not two days, but seven days. And no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. So two things have to be taken away. Leavened products, leavened bread, and the leaven itself. So yeast, bicarbonate of soda, a leavening agent has to be taken out your premises, and the leavened products equally taken out. Two parts got to be removed, right? So you put out the leaven and leavening agents and you bring in and consume unleavened produce. So two parts, I think, there to, to keeping unleavened bread properly. And I think that's uh, a picture of how you and I are to conduct our lives. There are some things that you and I are to put out of our lives and some things we are to bring in. Put out the leaven, bring in the unleavened. Right, put out the bad things from your life, right? Uh, the sins, right? Big, small, whatever, put them out, and then bring in the good things into your life, whatever they might be kindness, generosity, you know, tolerance, and so on. Put out the bad, bring in the good, right? But after all, you and I are supposed to be lights, are we not? Salt of the earth, that type of stuff. Now, if you think about it, you know, God himself doesn't really need the Feast of Unleavened Bread, does he? <laughs> I think God is perfect and holy and righteous. He doesn't need these holy days. So he's given them to us, given us instructions for our benefit, right? So that we'll learn important lessons, putting out spiritual leaven, bringing in spiritual unleavened, right? There's important reasons here why God wants to do this for, for our benefit. Like I say, not, not for his benefit. And of course, it's it's uh, it's good, I think, to take time to to deleaven our homes, to find leaven products, leaven agents, and put them out. That that's good, right? Don't want to downplay that. But if that's all that happens, you know, we go round our house 
umpteen times, vacuum cleaners and you know, sort of radar looking for a crumb of, of dried bread that might have fallen behind the sofa nine months earlier. If that's all we do, uh, we've wasted our time, we've wasted God's time, all right? End of the day, God's not overly concerned about uh, a crumb that's behind your cooker somewhere, right? Um, if it's just physical effort that we just de in our homes, spring cleaning, well, you know, all right. But the importance of the festival is spiritual truth, spiritual lessons and spiritual change. That's what God gave them to us for, not so that we could clean our homes, but so that we could clean our lives out. Right? That's the purpose. So leaven is, as we probably know, a symbol, right? Leaven symbolizes something. Unleavened symbolizes something. So to understand the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we need to understand what the symbols biblically mean. And of course, God's given it to us in a sort of annual cycle. So you go around the holy days, you know, Passover, Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, and then, you know, trumpets and atonement. And then we come down the next year and then the year after we go around again. So we're always going around this, this cycle to remind us on an sort of annual basis of, of these particular truths. Right, so here we are at the feast of unleavened bread at the sort of beginning of the annual cycle for this year. Uh, what does leaven mean? How does God use leaven in Scripture? What, what lessons can we get from from leaven? Well, there's two, I think. Uh, let's look at number one. If we turn to First Corinthians in chapter five. So, first letter to the Corinthians in chapter five. Read verses six through eight. Um, for the first meaning of the term leaven, which of course you've been here before, so you know the story and where we're going. Nothing super new here, but you remember the story in Corinth was that uh, the, the congregation there, the folk there, the believers there, had allowed uh, an immoral man to, to be there, had his father's wife, right? Uh, so that was immoral, uh, and uh, Paul was disgusted. But the church of those days was a bit of a woke church, apparently, right? So they were tolerating evil, and they were quite chuffed up, quite proud of it. Well, we're very tolerant. We've got this sinner here, but rather than throwing him under the bus somewhere, you know, we're trying to work with this sinner and show love and, and, and warmth and affection towards this sinner. Paul says, really? Well, I'll tell you what, you need to pass him over to Satan, for the destruction of his flesh, because this is evil and ridiculous and wrong. Stop it, right? So then he moves on to verses 6 through 8. Your glorying is not good. They thought they were a fantastic job of showing tolerance and love and inclusiveness and so on. Paul's not having it. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know? Here we go. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. That's what you do with the yeast and leaven. It permeates and puffs up. And he says, by allowing that sort of sin, it's going to spread throughout the church and contaminate and corrupt more widely. So you need to get this out. Therefore, purge out or cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. What feast do you think that might be? <laughs> well, the word leaven and unleavened appears about, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten times in this, these few verses. It's pretty obvious. Uh, well, obvious to you and me. If you're somebody who keeps the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's obvious. If you're a translator of the Bible and you don't keep any of these apart from Christmas and Easter, uh, you won't really pick it up because you don't do this. You don't practice this. So it doesn't really connect to your, your mind. But to you and me, it's yeah, pretty obvious. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast. What feast? Not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, the feast of unleavened bread. And what we see here is Paul uh, using the term leaven, and he says, uh, verse 8, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So Paul's using leaven here, I think under inspiration, leaven pictures malice and wickedness. You know, malice is uh, evil motivation, uh, evil thoughts, you know, evil motives. That's what malice is. You do things with malice aforethought, I think the legal guys would say. 
So it's of an evil intention, an evil motive. Wickedness, of course, is evil actions. So whether it's your motives that are harmful and wrong and evil and wicked, whether it's your actions that are wicked, Paul says that's leaven, the leaven of malice and wickedness, right? Sinful attitudes, that's what leaven pictures. But rather, he says, you should swap that for the unleavened bread of sincerity and uh, truth, you know. So put, put away the leaven and bring in the unleavened. Put away the malice and wickedness, bring in sincerity and truth. That's a good lesson. So leaven here is used in the sense broadly of sin, sinful behavior, sinful conduct, sinful attitudes. Of course, we know that, right? The other use of leaven, one that is not, I think, uh, as, as always fully understood, we find in Matthew chapter 16, uh, episode in the life of the Lord Jesus. So Matthew chapter 16. <clears throat> Everybody's dog knows that leaven pictures sin. Well, I'm not sure about the dog, but most churchgoers. Well, most churchgoers that keep the feasts know that. I guess your average churchgoer hasn't got a clue. But uh, there we go. So Matthew 16, let's read verses 5 through 12, where the Lord Jesus has uh, another explanation for what leaven pictures. Verse 5. Now, when his disciples had come to the other side of the lake of Galilee, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Obviously an important warning, which went straight over the heads of the disciples. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Oh, he's criticizing us because we've taken no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you've brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many large baskets you took up? You know, Jesus already shown them that he can feed thousands. He can feed thousands with a tiny piece of bread, the odd little fish. Right. He's shown them that at least twice very recently. And he says, don't you don't you understand? You know, bread's not a problem to me. Right. Verse 11, how is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Then they understood, <laughs> belatedly, that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine or the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So Jesus uses leaven here to picture false teaching, a false doctrine, which can be a problem, right? I mean, it starts to influence. You have a little bit of false doctrine, a little bit of false teaching that can spread and contaminate and get wider and wider and more and more people share it. So a bit like leaven. But the point is there that Jesus makes it very plain and direct, straightforward, plain English. Leaven pictures false teaching, false doctrine. So leaven pictures sin and leaven pictures false doctrine, right? And to an extent, of course, those would be related because, you know, false teaching, false doctrine leads to false believing, leads to false thinking, leads to false actions, leads to sin and harm. So there's a, a connection there. So let's look, first of all, at the, uh, the picture of leaven being uh, sin, all right, and see what we can learn or be reminded of there. So, I mean, when we put leaven, leaven products out of our homes at this time of year, uh, we're putting sin out, or at least we're demonstrating in our hearts the, the desire, the will to put sin out of our lives. When you put leaven out, you have to be aware it's there, of course, you know, check the ingredients on your packets and so on. Oh, oh, yeast or oh you know, bicarbonate soda or whatever. So you've got to be aware and then take appropriate action, a bit like sin. You know, when you come across sin in your life, you say, oh, oh I've got sin in my life. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> right? Well, <clears throat> no. It's like, oh, I found sin in my life. Right? 
perhaps you become a bit uh, you know casual you know easy come easy go but if if that were to be the case then every year at feast of unleavened bread time we're reminded that we shouldn't be too casual with sin we should endeavor always to keep sin out of our lives and to bring in the the good things into our lives right um there's also a bit of a picture here of um some people's idea of salvation because you know some people come to the lord jesus right so they accept the lord jesus as their personal savior uh, and some people that's that's it yeah i believe in jesus so I've come to the cross i've accepted jesus as my savior well, i'm finished now you know i'm just going to rely on the finished work of jesus once saved always saved no more needs to be done because i accepted jesus as my savior which of course is uh, passover right um but if you look at the picture of these holy days and what actually happened way back in in ancient uh, egypt ancient israel kept the passover right they had the blood of the lamb on the doors the lintels and and they uh, they concealed themselves behind those doors and they were protected by the blood of the lamb they were delivered by the blood of the lamb just like somebody who comes to jesus and receives jesus shed blood for the forgiveness of their sins is that the end of the story though is that is that the end of the road what about ancient israel they were protected you know by the blood of the lamb the passover lamb but the day later where were they um they were still in egypt right they were still in the land of pharaoh they were still in the land of bondage they were still subject to the taskmasters who could have come after them at any time so they'd been passed over right by the destroying angel they'd been protected by the blood of the lamb but they were still in bondage they were still under the jurisdiction of the pharaoh picturing you know satan they had to leave they had to do something you had to take action so just having the blood of the passover lamb is not the whole story you know just that's it finished once saved always saved just like ancient israel you and i have to leave sin to leave satan to leave our bondage and to head off towards the kingdom of god just as they left and headed off to the promised land at least in theory right so you don't just stop because the blood of the lamb has uh, has covered you you have to do what ancient israel did get out take action you know leave leave your old life behind leave bondage behind leave pharaoh behind move that's something that we have to do which means of course living right starting a way of life which is right and proper in god's sight as you head towards the coming kingdom right look at romans chapter 6 we'll read a fair amount of romans starting in 6 and verse 1 and you'll see as we go through this uh this passage here how paul you know likens to our former way of life as to being in bondage to sin i don't, don't think he mentions uh, satan anywhere but you can you can think of satan you know as the uh, as the, the prince of darkness so you and i are living in sin we, we don't know that at the time but we're in bondage to sin again we don't know that at the time but thanks to jesus shed blood we are delivered and set free from that bondage but we don't then stay there we don't just camp in bondage we don't remain camping in in ancient egypt we have to do what they did we have to head off take action get out leave bondage behind leave pharaoh behind leave satan behind leave our bondage and head off towards freedom so let's start in romans 6 and uh, verses uh, 1 to 14 i think to start with and paul brings out do we stay in bondage right we've been delivered by the passover blood of the lamb but do we say that's that's it jesus is my savior i'm just going to stay here now well of course not what shall we say then he asks shall we continue in sin that grace may abound certainly not how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it right you fall off the donkey or as somebody once said uh and bang your head on a rock yeah shall we continue in sin that grace may abound what have you fallen off a donkey and you know banged your head and forgot what's real and what's not verse 3 do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into christ jesus 
were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. There should be a big change. Not continuing in sin, not dwelling in Egypt, but, but leaving on a new way of life. Verse 5, For if we have been united together in the likeness of Jesus' death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So I think it becomes clearer as we go along that Paul's using this picture of you and I being slaves, which until we were called by God, until we received the blood of the Lamb, until we you know repented and made those changes, we were slaves. We didn't realize that. Most of the world doesn't realize that they're slaves of sin, heading for death, slaves of Satan, right? But you and I have been set free. We're no longer slaves. Verse 7, For he who has died has been freed from sin. That's us. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. Uh, you, you know to have left sin we're in a new way that leads to the promised land to, to God's kingdom you know sin isn't something that we should be playing with we shouldn't be camped in in the sin area right don't let sin reign it did in olden days when we were blind when we were in the land of uh, of Egypt spiritually right we just did what we felt like doing but now we are to put leaven out, put the sin out. We are not to let sin reign in our mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts, and do not present your members, arms, legs, eyes, ears, as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members, rather, as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under law, but under grace. Let's drop down to verses 16 to 22. Again, you just see Paul looking back as our former way of life was sinful, as we lived in the land of bondage, from which we are now set free. So that really shouldn't be something that, that we play around in. Verse, uh, what did I say, verse 16? 16, 16, 16. <clears throat> Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin, slave of sin leading to death, or, you could argue, a slave of obedience leading to righteousness. So are you and I to be slaves of sin? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? No, we've left the area of sin, that's behind us. That was the old you and the old me. But now we've moved on in a new way. Verse 17, But God be thanked that though you were, once upon a time, slaves of sin, yet you've now obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, as ancient Israel was set free from slavery and bondage, having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented in old times your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members, your body, as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Goodbye bondage, goodbye sin, a new way of life now with sincerity and righteousness and obedience. Verse 20, 
For when you were slaves of sin, and we all were, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now properly ashamed? For the end of those things is death. That's what you get if you live in sin. But now, having been set free from sin and having become, so to speak, slaves to God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end of the outcome, everlasting life. Right? So if, if we say goodbye to sin, say goodbye to bondage, to, to, say, to Satan, to our Pharaoh, to the taskmasters, and we start to live properly, uh, obediently, having been set free, as ancient Israel most certainly should have done when they left Egypt, then the outcome is eternal life, right? That's pretty good, right? So we don't stick around in the spiritual Egypt, spiritual Egypt being sin. That's, we were there, right? We were trapped and held in bondage there, but now we've been set free. So adios, goodbye. I'm moving on now to a better way of life. If you look at Romans chapter 12, we turn there for a moment. Romans chapter 12, let's read verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. So, yeah, quite strong language, I beseech you. Still just saying, oh, in passing. <laughs> Be a good idea if you did this, folk. <clears throat> I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God, which is your reasonable or logical service. Give your body to God and your instruments, your members, that we just read earlier, to doing good things, right things, proper things on this new way of life, having left sin behind you. Verse 2, do not be conformed uh, to this, this world. Uh, this world, I think God would class it as spiritual Egypt. Most of the world, human society, this age that you and I live in, it's a pretty, uh, pretty dodgy place, right? It's very much spiritual Egypt. Don't want to let that mould us and shape us. That's not going to help at all. That's where we were. Do not let, sorry, do not be conformed or moulded or shaped to this age or society, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we don't want to be contaminated by the world, which is behind us. We've, we're on a different journey now. We've left Egypt. We're like the ancient Israelites. They were headed off from Egypt, you know, through the wilderness and heading to the promised land. That's our journey. Goodbye to the bondage to, to sin. It's a new way of life where we seek not to be conformed or shaped by the society around us, but rather we renew our mind. And we renew our mind, of course, largely by looking to the values, the eternal values that Scripture shows us. That's what we do, right? Look at the first John chapter 2, first letter of John. So living right is what we should be doing, not continuing in sin, that grace may abound, but living right. <laughs> yeah. So 1 John chapter 2 and verses 1 through 6. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, that's not what you and I are interested in. And if anyone sins, which of course you know we will from time to time, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, <coughs> and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Right? So we do sin from time to time. It shouldn't be deliberate, of course. We just sometimes we get caught out by, by surprise, a bit sort of a lazy here and there. Uh, we sort of uh, don't remain sharp and focused. It can happen. We get tempted and so on. But if we sin, Jesus Christ is our advocate and the propitiation for our sins, right? But ideally, he says, I write to you so that you may not sin, because that's not, that's not productive. 
When you see leaven in your homes at this time of year, you put it out. When you see sin in your life at any time of the year, you put it out. Right? You try to be unleavened in your life, just as at this time of year our homes are unleavened. Verse 3 through 6. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, I'm a Christian, I'm a disciple of Christ, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, a lot of people claim to be Christians and, uh, and believers, and a lot of people don't keep the commandments. Lots of churches don't keep the commandments. Right? Lots of churches you know, welcome and, uh, and uh, support and affirm people who are in LGBTQ+, etc., right? Um, there's ways of dealing with people who've got problems there, of course, but affirming that that's a valid choice of lifestyle is, is not, right? Whoever keeps his word, verse 5, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in Christ ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Anybody who claims to be a believer, a disciple of Christ, has to walk just as Jesus walked. Right? Jesus. Now, Jesus um, lived right. There was no sin in the Lord Jesus, right? Though he was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. But Jesus lived a sinless life. And in the Christian, one who says he abides in Christ, ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Did Jesus keep the Sabbath? Yeah. Did Jesus keep the holy days? Mm, yep. Did Jesus uh, turn away from unclean meats? Uh, yep. Was Jesus kind and tolerant? Yep. Uh, did Jesus set a good example? Yep. Was he salt of the earth and light to the world? Yep, yep, yep. And that's what you and I are to do. So sin and bondage is behind us. We're on a different path now. We're on a path that leads to the promised land. Right? Look at John, first John chapter 5. So you're looking at being an unleavened person, having an unleavened life. It really means a, a life without sin. Because if leaven pictures sin, malice and wickedness, if you put that out, what's left, of course, is a, a life without sin, i.e., that is to say, a commandment keeper, a person who lives right. That's what unleavened looks like. First John chapter 5, let's read verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is, I think it should be begotten of God and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him it's consistent the Greek as well by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments an unleavened life for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome or grievous. Not grievous, but uh, grievous, right? <laughs> Been there before, right? This is the love of God, verse 3, that we keep his commandments. We all, you don't want to keep God's commandments because they're terrible. I mean, they're so restrictive. Your life will be bondage trying to keep God's commandments. You can't do this and you can't do that, right? But John, who uh, you know leaned on the Lord's bosom at that final Passover, says this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. They're not grievous. They're not bondage. In fact, they set us free from bondage to Pharaoh, to Satan, and so on, right? So living right is, is, is key. Now, in the, uh, the Greek, um, verse 3, the, the verbs there are in the what they call the continuous present tense. So you could translate that just to bring it out more clearly. For this is the love of God that we keep and keep on keeping his commandments. It means keep on a continuous basis. We keep and we keep on keeping his commandments. We don't, don't give that up, right? So that's putting leaven out means putting sin out and seeking to live a spiritually unleavened life as a commandment keeper. And of course, we have to endeavor not to get weary while doing good, right? Because... I think we know a little leaven. Leaven's a whole lump. So if we get a little bit sort of casual 
and comfortable with sin in our lives, just a little bit, just a little tiny bit of adultery. Well, that's not a good place to go, of course, but <laughs> right? So for the seven days of unleavened bread, we look for leaven and we put it out and we seek to remain unleavened. It's a seven-day uh, practice, but the lesson, of course, is, is applicable for the whole year. We should always be seeking to put out sin and living an unleavened life without sin. But commandment keepers, people who do good, people who do right, people who are holy, right, and looking forward to everlasting life. That's what our lives should be like. I mean, we're not perfect there, of course, um, but we should be improving, of course, year by year by year. Now, secondly, we said the leaven picture is false teaching. Okay, that's the alternative uh, meaning of it. Jesus warned, if you remember, he warned his disciples. He says, guys, uh, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, these were, of course, the religious leaders of the day. So Jesus is warning his own disciples, not warning the crowds out there. He's saying, disciples of mine who know me and who follow me, watch out in your lives for the teaching of these religious people, right? I've often thought in the past that, you know, most of us are unlikely, unlikely at least, to be deceived by, say, Roman Catholics or by Pope Francis or perhaps by the Mormons, right? But what's more likely to deceive us is people that come from our background. Because I think if people come from your sort of backgrounds, so churches that you've been in and that you recognize and so on are comfortable with, that's where sometimes you can relax and let your guard down a little bit because, well, we just like me. We've come through the same sort of church experiences, right? We, we, we've shared, you know, Sabbath services, uh, church services. Uh, we've done a lot of things together. So that's one of the areas where you have to be a little bit careful is people that you let your guard down with. You know, in the New Testament, it's full of warnings about deception and deceivers. Lots of them, right? And they're for a reason, because deception is a big problem, especially the end time, but there's always been deception from the days of the Apostle Paul and Peter and so on, right? So those warnings about deception are there for a, for a reason. And Jesus' warning about leaven of religious leaders is there for a reason as well. In recent years, I've come across a number of uh, surprising teachings that I didn't see coming. <laughs> the calendar has been won uh, over the years where there's a lot of debates and disputes about how you organize uh, God's calendar. We're going to keep the holy days. We ought to keep them in God's timing. Well, but what is the calendar? Uh, what's right and what's wrong? I've, I've seen quite a number of disputes over the question of when is Passover? Does it take place at the beginning of the 14th of Nisan or at the end of the 14th of Nisan into the 15th of Nisan? Oh, what's right? Do you keep the Passover at all? Or, or did Jesus not keep that and introduce something called the Lord's Supper as an alternative? Right? Uh, Pentecost. Okay, it's another of God's appointed times. Does it fall on a Sunday? Does it fall on a, a Monday? Does it always fall on the same date, Sivan the sixth? Because that's what the Jews have ended up with. So which of those is correct? And I've heard different stories from people I used to, you know, read and sometimes assemble with, right? And uh, you can keep on going. Sacred names. Must you use this sort of Hebrew <coughs> name, Yeshua? Yahweh, Yehoshua, or can you use Jesus, God, which is permissible? And some people take a very strong view and things like that, right? So you can carry on going, but there's lots of strange teachings out there, uh, wrong teachings out there. Like I said earlier, you know, wrong teaching leads, leads, to, long, leads wrong to wrong believing, leads, leads to wrong thinking, leads. which often leads to wrong, wrong behavior action. and actions and so on, can lead to harm can lead to death. So we have to watch teachings because teachings sometimes produce outcomes that can be quite quite harmful, right? So we need to check our beliefs from time to time. But look at Galatians chapter 5 as our first uh, passage. Galatians chapter 5, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. <clears throat> And we're looking at the meaning of leaven, which Jesus said, beware the teaching of religious leaders. 
verses 1 through 4, Galatians 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Well, the blood of the Lamb sets us free from bondage to, to Pharaoh, to Satan, and so on. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. We're not going back there. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you, if you become circumcised, for example, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. I think the New American Bible says you've become severed from Christ. You become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Well, we don't want to fall from grace. Don't want to be severed from the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And what the people here have been doing was they were listening to teachers. Uh, obviously can't cover the entire letter, but it's evident that there were troublemakers coming out from mm, Jerusalem, I think, to the brethren with new teaching, with a revised teaching, with a new information that you need to live properly. So these troublemakers were causing difficulties, and Paul was quite nervous about whether or not the Galatians could survive this false teaching, this false doctrine, which could bring you to great harm. Right? Hence the warning, uh, dropping down to verses 7 through 9. You, you ran well, you, know, you were doing okay, guys. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion, this false teaching, does not come from him who calls you a little leaven, leavens the whole lump. So, you know, Paul is going to use false teaching as a little leaven, but it permeates, it spreads, it contaminates. And Paul's not at all sure that uh, the believers are going to survive this false teaching. Now, they shouldn't have allowed even a little bit to get there. They should have put the leaven out at the first moment it arrived. Be aware and conscious of leaven, of false teaching, and get it out. Don't go with that, but I think it was too late. Right, verse 12. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. Those who trouble you. It was people, right? People were moving among the Galatian brethren with new and improved washes whiter teaching. But it was destructive. If we turn to Galatians 1 just for a moment. Just catch up on Paul's concerns. Galatians 1, let's read verses 6 through 8. <clears throat> Paul says, I marvel, other translations, I am astounded, I am astonished, I can't believe this, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. These troublemakers had brought a different gospel, different truth, right, different doctrines, leaven which is not another, but there are some who trouble you, absolutely, and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we've already preached to you, let him be accursed, and so on. So Paul was quite concerned that they were turning away already from the truth, right? They were severed from Christ, right? That's a bad place to be. They were fallen from grace. And I think it looks quite likely that most of the Galatian brethren are eternally lost. Right? They left Paul. They left the truth. They left the Lord Jesus Christ. Why was that? Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And they allowed the leaven of false teaching to permeate them. Right? And you and I should remain vigilant, always watchful, Right, as best we can do at least and ask God for his help otherwise that we can be alert and watchful and, and God can sort of reach us just alert us that, no no don't go this way if we look at Second Peter chapter 1 my feeling is that um, my feeling at least is that deception takes a little while to work it's not just overnight right at 2 Peter chapter 2 I think it's normally slow, but like 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 yeast, 
like leaven that, that just keeps on working. So unless you get it out, it's, oh, leaven, that's got to go out of my life. Oh, false teaching, that's got to go. I don't want to harbour false teaching, right, if you're alert to it. So Second uh, Peter, Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, uh, yeah, another warning of false doctrine. And there's plenty of them in Scripture. But there were also false prophets among the people in Old Testament times, even as there will be. It's not a maybe. There will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Well, that's leaven, right? Even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will even be blasphemed. The way of truth will be blasphemed. You know, these troublemakers will bring in heresies, false teaching, false doctrine. Many people will be affected by it. So Peter says, verse 3, by covetousness or, or greed, I think some translations say, by covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words or words of deception. For a long time their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. So these secretly bring in words of deception, false teaching, leaven, right? And too many people sort of seem to go with it, which of course you should not do, right? And if we spot false teaching, if we spot false teaching, we should, boop, out it goes, not for me, I'm not going to play around with, with leaven, spiritual leaven, like a, you know, like a, a time bomb in my life. Now look at Second Timothy chapter 3, because the, the main antidote, uh, I think we all realise, to deception is the truth, right? If you want to spot deception, ideally be somebody who's red hot on the truth. So Second Timothy chapter 3, Paul reminds us of um, <clears throat> 2 Timothy, oops, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to read verses 13 through 17, all very well known such scriptures, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 13, but evil men and imposters or seducers or deceivers will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Well, it's another warning, right? I've said there's plenty of warnings in the New Testament. There's another one there. Paul says it's going to get worse. In time to come, it will be worse, right? These uh, imposters, these evil men, they will deceive and they'll be deceived themselves and then they'll pass on their new deception to you. It's going to be quite troublesome, right? Deception everywhere. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Well, the holy scriptures that Timothy knew from childhood would be the Old Testament, right? And Paul says there, the holy scriptures, the Old Testament, that's all they had in those days, are able to make you wise for salvation. But surely... The Old Testament is full of, you know, wars and genocides and killings and incest and rape and pillaging. and There's surely nothing there for a believer. Well, Paul thought there was, right? He says, you've known the Holy Scriptures, not just the writings. You've known the Holy Writings from a childhood, which are able to make you wise for salvation, eternal life, valuable. And, of course, part of it is by knowing the Holy Scriptures then you'll be more alert to false teaching. Oh, hang on a second. I don't like what I heard there. That's, that's not consistent with what I read in Leviticus or Numbers or Exodus or Samuel or whatever, or Book of Proverbs. Oh, not having that. Woo, back off. Right? That's what you do if you know the truth. Verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. True doctrine, of course, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the man of God or the woman of God is going to be fully equipped to, to live right, to live without, you know, more than the 
minimum amount of sin and, and thoroughly equipped to, to see off false doctrine, false teaching, leaven, because they are familiar with Scripture given by God for reproof, correction, doctrine, and instruction in righteousness, right? And uh, it says earlier there, verse um, 14, you must continue in the things which you have learned. Well, keeping the holy days is part of continuing in what, what we've learned. I'm sure Timothy kept the holy days and continued with them. Right, so here we are, right, sort of coming to the conclusion. Um, we're in the seven days of unleavened bread. In fact, they just sort of started, right? I think most of us will remain fairly vigilant, you know, day by day by day, in case we find something in a cupboard somewhere on the back of the fridge or in a pocket in our coat. Oh, my word, got a biscuit here. How would that get there, right? <coughs> Satan must have done that, right? Um, so we'll probably be quite vigilant in the next few days, keeping our eyes peeled for any, any leaven that we might come across. But more important than that, not you know, dismissing it, but much more important than that is learning the spiritual lesson, right, of leaven, which God says leaven pictures sin, you know, malice and wickedness, and leaven pictures false teaching, right, and both of those you and I should be alert to every day, not just seven days, like, oh, so, you know, days are finished now, I can accept false teaching from tomorrow, <laughs> no, the the practice of unleavened bread is seven days in duration. The lessons we take forever, right? Literally forever, right? So let's be uh, vigilant as we move forward from, from today. Watch out in your life for sin. Don't get casual. Little leaven. So watch out for sin in your life. Seek to be unleavened. A commandment keeper that lives a righteous life, not being conformed by this world, this age. And of course, as far as you can, remain alert and vigilant to false teaching, especially from people that you might normally be fairly comfortable around because those are the more likely to be problems in your life. Okay, and whenever you, whenever you find leaven, uh, put it away. Okay, and with that we will conclude today's uh, message.